Psalm 32. Psalm 32 and verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. These are great verses, and Paul refers to this in the epistle to the Romans, in Romans 4, 6 through 8, where he says, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. In the Old Testament, they didn't have the benefits that we have of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ simply because it just hadn't happened yet. Uh, their sins were forgiven when they offered the prescribed sacrifice, but you see, those sacrifices couldn't clear them. It says in Exodus 34, 7, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. They had their sins forgiven, but they weren't cleared. David's sin wasn't imputed to him, but at the same time, it wasn't taken away. It says in Hebrews 10, 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. David even committed two sins in his life that there was no sacrifice for. He committed adultery and murder. The Lord put away those sins. He had what is called the sheer mercies of David. That's a great picture of eternal security. But David didn't have all these benefits that me and you have today as born-again Christians. But David said, blessed is he whose sin is covered. He had, him co he had his sin covered, but he wasn't redeemed like me and you are back then. It says in Hebrews 9.15, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. You see... Nobody had real redemption until the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross. So, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. So my transgressions are forgiven. They're cleared. My sins are more than covered. They're taken away. And the Lord doesn't impute iniquity to me, but he imputed the righteousness of Jesus Christ to me. As salvation. You see, Abraham, he got imputed righteousness. But even that wasn't the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ that, that was imputed to me. I, had, I have something even better than Abraham did. You have something even better than Abraham and David did. Just because of the cross. What Jesus Christ did on the cross, you see, Jesus Christ hadn't died yet. So they didn't have all the benefits that come along with that applied to them. It says in verse 2, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. So in 1 Peter 2, 1, it says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings. Guile is craft, craftiness, being cunning, and using deceit. And it's, it tells us about the Lord Jesus Christ in 1 Peter 2, 22. It says, Who did no sin... Neither was guile found in his mouth. So just another warning of what's what you say. What's what's coming out of your mouth. In Psalm 32 and verse 3 it says, When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. How can you be silent and roar at the same time? is a question that might come up when you read this verse. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring well when you um, you can be quiet on the outside and full of pain on the inside so to everybody else you're silent but then on the inside you got all this roaring going on when you keep silent and don't ever confess your sins to the lord it can work on you physically it's a mental thing, but it works on you physically at the same time and makes your bones wax old your mental state can affect your physical state. And David says other things about the, the bones. He said in Psalm 6, 2, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. 
In Psalm 31, 10, it says, For my life is spent with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity, and my bones are consumed. In Psalm 38, 3, it says, There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. You see, staying silent and not acknowledging your sin uh, to God will make an old man out of you. He says in verse 4 in Psalm 32, For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. David had been crying so much day and night that his tears dried up. It turned into the drought of summer. Notice the Selah putting you in mind of the tribulation and the second coming. Uh, David is a picture of the tribulation saint who will see the drought of summer. You see, every time you see that word Selah in the context, you're going to see it's about the second coming or the tribulation. And here David talks about the drought of summer. And in James chapter 5, a last day's book, it, in James chapter 5, it talks about the last days. And then by the end of the chapter, it's talking about Elijah shutting up the heaven and the Old Testament, causing a drought. And then in Revelation 11, 4 through 7, it talks about the two witnesses. One of them is Elijah. And the two witnesses have power to shut heaven so that it might not rain. You see, water is going to be a, an extremely valuable thing in the tribulation time period. And it's going to bring, there's going to be droughts. And David just happens to mention a drought here. That's because, you see, when you read the Psalms, you're, historically you're reading about David and the troubles he was going through. Prophetically, you're reading stuff about the tribulation and the second coming. But he says in verse 5, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and, my, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my, iniquity of my sin. Selah. The best thing to do is acknowledge to God about your sin. He already knows you've done wrong. You might as well go ahead and confess it. Not to be saved, not to stay saved, but to keep close fellowship with the Lord. You need to confess your sins. Acknowledge to God that you've sinned. It says in Proverbs twenty three thirteen, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Psalm 32, 6, it says, For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Notice the floods of great waters. And since... The floods of great waters. Since the Psalms are heavy on the tribulation, this reminds us of Revelation twelve fifteen, which says, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. But look what happens. And the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So Psalm 32, 6. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh to him. So they're going to, in the tribulation, they're going to be praying. The Lord's going to have the earth open its mouth, swallow up the flood that the dragon cast out of his mouth. So David says, Pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. It's what he, in uh, Psalm 32, 6, For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Now for me and you, the Lord can always be found. I'm in the body of Christ. I'm sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But in the Old Testament, this wasn't always so. Saul couldn't get a hold of the Lord by the way of a prophet by Urim or anything. It says in 1 Samuel 28, 6, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. I can get an answer from the Lord from, from my Bible. It has all the answers. I have a permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I have 24-7 access to fellowship with the Lord. David says in Psalm 32, 7, Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. 
Thou shalt come past me about with songs of deliverance, Selah. So in that future tribulation time period, the Jews will be fleeing to the mountains. They're going to need a hiding place. And David said, Thou art my hiding place. They're going to need a hiding place from the Antichrist and his henchmen. The Lord is the best hiding place. He's never lost a game of hide and seek. Adam tried it back in Genesis 3 and lost badly. The great men, the rich men, the chief captains and mighty men will try it in Revelation 6. They lose badly. And David tells the Lord in Psalm 32, 7, Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. What is the title of the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week? The time of Jacob's trouble. David says, Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. So the Bible talks about songs. In Exodus 15, 1, it shows you a song of Moses. In Psalm 40 and verse 3, it says, He hath put a new song in my mouth. In Revelation 5, 9 and Revelation 14, 3, you have them singing a new song in heaven. Maybe one day God will give us a CD that has the Bible's soundtrack on it. Uh, David played a song on a harp to King Saul, and it drove away the unclean spirits in 1 Samuel sixteen twenty three, Elisha had a minstrel play before he preached in 2 Kings three fifteen. You have people playing on harps in heaven in Revelation 5, 8, 14, 2, and 15, 2. This might sound like blasphemy to the Church of Christ people, but I bet there will even be banjos in heaven, and lemonade, and sweet tea, and apple cider, and maybe... A uh, Cajun filet biscuit from Bojangles, too, but but way better. You see, all these things that we love down here, music, food, I believe that stuff we're going to have for eternity, but way better. Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. So the Lord will instruct you. This is when you really don't want to throw out the instructions. You know, a lot of times when you get the... The, the new thing at the store, you got to put it together and you don't want to take the time to take out the instructions and read how to put it together. You just want to shove everything together. Well, this is the time you don't want to throw away the instructions. You want to keep it with you at all times. The Lord will instruct you. It says in 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. In righteousness. You don't want to throw out the scriptures. You want to read them. You don't want to try to instruct yourself on this. The Lord will teach you. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. In 1 Corinthians 2.13 it says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So you've got your instruction book, the Bible. And in that, the Holy Ghost teaches you, you compare spiritual things with spiritual, like we're doing now. We look at one verse, then we compare it with another verse, then we compare it with another verse. He will guide you as well, it says. And in John sixteen thirteen, it says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Now, Psalm 32, 9, Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. So get some understanding. Have some sense. The horse has no understanding. If he's not held with bit and bridle, he'll run off a cliff. He'll just run right, right off. He won't ever stop. You have to tell him. He gets so scared of just anything that he'll he'll kick you off. He'll kick you. He uh, He'll kick the hand that feeds him. He, he has no understanding. So don't be like the horse and the mule. Get some understanding. The crazy thing is, people put their trust in horses more than they do God. In Psalm 20 and verse 7, it says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And you say, well, well, that's crazy. Well, you trust in your car more than you trust in God. You trust your vehicle enough to get you from home to the workplace you trust your vehicle enough when you go on vacation to get you from home all the way to Florida. You put more trust in your car than you do the Lord. Psalm 32, 10, Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. 
many sorrows shall be to the wicked. Imagine if you're God and you've seen all the wicked things that wicked man has done to people over the years. God knows exactly how hot to turn the temperature up on each and every one of these people. He knows all the things that they've done. Nothing's going unpunished. Every man that doesn't put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to save them is going to an eternal lake of fire, and many sorrows shall be to the wicked. In Matthew 24, 8, Jesus Christ is describing the end times, and he talks about famines and pestilences and wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and everything else. Then he says this is the beginning of sorrows. You see, the wicked are going to have a hard time in those days. They're going to have a hard time at the second coming of Jesus Christ when he comes back in flaming fire taking vengeance, and then they're going to have many sorrows in hell. They may be living prosperous now. The wicked may be prospering now, but their time's coming. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. The only thing that is trustworthy is the Lord. And it blows my mind how people can just blindly believe everything they hear on the news. In their mind, I guess since their parents watch the news, everybody else watches the news, it's on TV, so they think that everything that comes out of those people's mouth is the truth. People trust in all kinds of things. But it says, But he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. I want mercy to compass me about. Every day I say, God, I know I don't deserve any mercy, but help me in this situation. Help me in that situation. Mercy is when God keeps you from something you deserve, something bad. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous. And shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. It says in Psalm thirty-two, eleven. If you can't be glad in anything, then you know you can be glad in the Lord. This takes on a whole new meaning for me than it did David. Because me and you are literally in the Lord. I can literally be glad in the Lord. I'm a part of the Lord's body. This should keep you up when you start feeling down. David says, Rejoice, ye righteous. Do you realize that on your soul you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ? You don't have your sinfulness and you don't have your own righteousness. You have the Lord's righteousness. This should make you rejoice. He says, Shout for joy. And notice at the beginning of the chapter, David said, My bones wax old through my roaring. But he was silent on the outside. Then after he acknowledged his sin to God and got back in close fellowship, now he's shouting for joy. So, staying in touch with God, acknowledging your sin to God, staying in close fellowship, you're going to be a lot better off both mentally and physically because your mental state affects your physical state. If you got some, some wicked stuff going on inside, it's going to affect the outside. 